are you aware of recent crash retrievals happening or are these very few and far between? Well, no, the, but I, I do know this. I do know that the Central Intelligence Agency itself has a center that nobody knew about. Uh, in, and actually, most other people don't know about it now. Uh, that, that, was, that was able to detect UFOs flying around even when they're fully uh, masked. This is Ross Coulthard, and you are listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy, and I am joined once again by President of the New Paradigm Institute, acclaimed civil rights activist and constitutional lawyer, Mr. Daniel Sheehan. Danny, welcome back. Thank you, Andy. It's good to be here. Always good to have you on. And it's not that long since we spoke. It was back in April. Um, and at that time, Danny, to refresh our memory, we were hopefully on the verge of a new Schumer Rounds Amendment, uh, UAP Disclosure Act 2.0, yes. having a second attempt at getting into the fiscal year 2025's NDA. We are now past that point. We have that UAP Disclosure Act 2.0. Yep. Very much the same as yes. what was attempted to get in last time. Yeah, so can you just talk us through where we're at and what's happening right now? Okay, yeah. It, it, in fact, Andy, it's exactly the same. Uh, but what there, there was a big uh, process going on inside the Senate Intelligence Committee and inside the Senate Armed Services Committee about uh, kind of tightening it up even more uh, and putting in a little more protections for the uh, UFO whistleblowers, uh, a whole bunch of details like that. Uh, and uh, the discussion went on between uh, Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, uh, and Michael Rounds, who was his co-sponsor. And Michael Rounds' staff decided that the best thing to do is to come back with the exact same bill uh, that was passed by the Senate virtually unanimously last year uh, uh, on January 27th, or excuse me, July 27th. And so that, that's what they decided to do, that they've come back with the, the exact same bill. Uh, and the Senate is proposing putting that into the National Defense Authorization Act. Now, there's an, one additional thing that's happened, and that is that Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut has put in a separate standalone bill, uh, which is proposing to increase the whistleblower protections for all whistleblowers all through the entire federal government. That the the proposals that were being made to try to strengthen the the last year's Schumer uh, rounds bill was going to put in a little bit stronger protections uniquely for the UFO whistleblowers. Uh, the the Senate has not chosen to do that yet, but over on the House side, uh, uh, Congressman Bruchette uh, asked our New Paradigm Institute to put in a standalone bill into the House that would give special protections to UFO whistleblowers, uh, sort of like, but even more so than what the proposed was hap proposal was on the Senate side to try to uh, add an addition to the old, the old Senate bill. But so, so we've got it. Uh, it's over on the House side now. Uh, uh, Congressman Burchette has had the meetings with uh, Johnson, Michael Johnson, who's the Speaker of the House, who uh, Tim Burchette thought was implying that if if Burchette would provide a standalone, extra strengthened UFO whistleblower protection act, that uh, Johnson would agree to put that on the floor mm -hmm. for a vote. Okay, that's where we are right now. So we have the we have uh, Schumer 2.0, which is identical to Schumer 1.0 on the Senate side, and now we've got this additional bill, uh, a significant portion of what might have been strengthening the Senate bill over on the House side. So if if we can get the House side bill passed as a standalone bill, uh, it'll be fine. It doesn't even have to go into the National Defense Authorization Act. It can be a standalone bill that gets passed. So that's, that's where we are technically right now. Uh, so the Senate has basically doubled down uh, <laughs> on the House uh, and said, look, no, we're serious about the decisions that we've made, the structure that we've set up, all the compromises that have been made by all the forces that are necessary over in the Senate. And we're demanding that you, you pass this. 
So that's uh, that's what's happening right now. And they're going to send that over to the House side around the 27th or so of uh, July. So what's giving you hope and others hope that by putting the same bill through again, it's going to get there this time? Because obviously a lot of folks were very disappointed when it was shot yes. down by what ultimately was it the four mics last time? Yes. Yeah, the four Michael, the Michaels over on the, over on yeah. the house side, yes, and so that that uh, you know the New Paradigm Institute uh, has has been involved in uh, putting in additional legislation over on the house side. The the challenge is that uh, Johnson, uh, who is the Speaker of the House, had taken the position that the bills that uh, for for example Robert Garcia uh, had put in a bill uh, over on the house side. Uh, sectioning out the creation of this new uh, records review board uh, that was part of the part of the Schumer uh, round Senate bill. He tried to get that put in as a separate bill over on the House side, uh, and uh, Speaker Johnson refused to allow that to go to the floor. Uh, and so there have been, and then uh, Tim Burchett had put in a short two-page bill just directing the president to order all of the military services and intelligence agencies, et cetera, to immediately release all of their, all of the information. It was a real simple, straightforward bill. Uh, and uh, and uh, Johnson, the Speaker of the House, refused to allow that to go onto the floor either. So those bills have been pushed aside, uh, but we still mm-hmm. have alive and well the New Paradigm Institute proposed bill to put in special protections for the UFO whistleblowers. Uh, and uh, in that bill, there are some additional provisions that are, interestingly enough, designed uh, not only the, the provisions to protect people who want to be whistleblowers from being retaliated against, but there are some also some immunities that are being proposed in that bill for people that are part of the legacy group who don't want to come forward uh, to basically impose, uh, to, to give to them immunity. Uh, for things they think they may be criminally liable for. And that's one of the reasons why they don't want to come forward. So we've gotten, we've provided for two forms of immunity. They call use immunity, that anything that they testify about can't be used against them. Uh, But there's another one even stronger in there that's called transactional immunity. And that if they agree to tell the Congress about a particular set of events that they can't be prosecuted under any circumstances. Uh, not only can their testimony not be used against them, but even if the government were to find other evidence proving that they committed a crime, that can't be used either. So we have we have put that, the New Paradigm Institute has proposed that to the House side. And uh, Congressman Burchette has that legislation now. He has uh, put that into the Rules Committee to try to get uh, the Speaker of the House to agree to put that bill on the floor over on the House side as a standalone independent bill. And that's an extremely important addition if we can get it. Uh, uh, but we'll but we'll see. Uh, now, the, the question is, you know, what what is, uh, you know, uh, Michael Turner, the chairman of the uh, House Intelligence Committee, Michael Rogers, the, the chair, the Republican chairman of the House Armed Services Committee and Michael Johnson, the Speaker of the House, what are they going to do with regard to, number one, that bill over on the House side that Johnson had implied he'd be willing to put on the floor as a standalone bill? And what is their response going to be to the reiteration on the part of the Senate uh, of Schumer rounds? So th- that's that's where we are right now. But as, as you know, there's this, this extraordinarily strange series of events going on here in the States right now. Uh, that, that not only has the the Republican uh, nominee for the, the presidency been shot uh, and survived and is now into uh, his resurrection <laughs> and having the major Republican convention, you know, having him be basically the Messiah who's come back from the dead uh, to try to increase his chances. And we've got the Democratic Party, uh, you know, uh, 80% of them at least, trying to get uh, President Biden to agree to step down. Uh, as the candidate, uh, and uh, and now he's gotten COVID uh, mm. as of this morning, uh, and uh, so that there's a kind of turmoil going on uh, at that level 
inside the the discussion that's going on between the Republican and Democratic Party. Uh, so all those things are happening right now. Uh, and what we're make, trying to make sure to do is not allow that to drown out the normal business of the of the government uh, that is supposed to be functioning. And one of the and now we're still looking at, of course, the October 20th date, uh, even in the bill that got passed last year. You remember, we got passed mm-hmm. the portion of the Schumer rounds bill that mandated that all of the six military services and all the 18 intelligence agencies and all 32 of the United States Defense Department agencies were ordered by Congress, signed into law by Biden, to gather together every single piece of information that they have about the UFO phenomenon and every single piece of information they have about this extraterrestrial or extra dimensional non-human intelligence, everything that they've gotten since January 1st of 1945. Uh, And they're commanded to have it all gathered together by October 20th and stand ready in the language of the Senate to immediately transfer that information on October 20th to the National Archives. The House has changed that language to say after October 20th, they have to provide it to the the National Archives as soon as possible. Hmm. And so we're not sure what that means. As lawyers, we know what it might mean. And that is that they have an excuse for not doing it immediately. and so we're, we're still trying to figure out now whether or not any of those uh, agencies that have been ordered to do so uh, have, in fact, uh, are they, where are they at in that process of gathering together all of that information? Or are they going to use the changed language on the House side to saying they don't have to turn it in immediately on October 20th? They have to do it as soon as possible thereafter. Uh, and we don't know what that means. Uh, yet. Uh, lawyers, uh, we haven't been able to determine exactly what is going on inside those th- those agencies because they're all top secret, right? So we don't, we're not sure that yet whether they're putting, they're gathering the information together and putting it into the digital format and creating the searchable index that they're supposed to have had ready by October 20th. So that's that's where things stand right now. If people are looking for more information on the UAP Disclosure Act, etc., definitely go back and check out when I spoke to Danny back in April because we broke it down in a bit more detail and we won't retread over old ground to make the most of Danny's time. Um, you mentioned whistleblowers, Danny, so let's talk about that situation. I yeah. think I think for many of us, and I'll, I'll include myself in this, I forget sometimes what the actual circumstances are of your average whistleblower. They're not just a, a group being kept in a pen like sheep who are waiting on being called upon at any time by people like yourself or congressmen and women to come up and testify in front of a camera. Is it right to say these are men and women who are still actively involved potentially in programs and are attending their place of work on a daily basis still? Yes, that's right. You know, they're they're the people that are inside the program, uh, primarily uh, at the present time, those who have been involved in the uh, UFO crash retrieval program, uh, which has a part A and a part B. The part A is if, in fact, uh, any UFO were to accidentally crash somewhere, uh, that they would be assigned to go get it uh, and retrieve that and bring it back into the into you know either S four you know over at the Skunk Works uh, at Area fifty one. Uh, for analysis in potential back engineering. Uh, uh, or the question is whether there's what they call a kinetic program, which is an active program to attempt to bring down UFOs, to actually target them, uh, not shoot them with regular you know, gunship uh, F-18 fighters, because that doesn't work. They know that. But that they've tried to develop other alternative means of uh, bringing down the UFOs. At least there's serious indications that there is such a kinetic program there. Okay, so that there's the people that have been involved in that side, the UFO crash retrieval, and then there's the people that have been involved in the back engineering, uh, the attempted back engineering. Now, a lot of those people are over on the aerospace side. They're in the aerospace corporations because they're the ones that have been tasked with doing this. And one of the challenges is that the House of Representatives took out of the Schumer Rounds bill, 
that went over. One of the things that was taken out of that when it went over to the House side is they eliminated the mandate that the private aerospace corporation people have to turn over all their information. Uh, they they cut that out. Uh, so the obviously the private aerospace corporation people are not engaged in any process of trying to gather together all the information and materials uh, that they're that they're not doing that right now. So, uh, but but there are a number of people that are in the government who are knowledgeable about the back engineering program and who themselves have been involved in it, uh, and they have come forward. So there are approximately forty of these people. Uh, now, one of the challenges is that we've had uh, the New Paradigm Institute has had face-to-face -face a meeting uh, with uh, Senator Warner, who is the chairman uh, of the Intelligence Committee on the Senate side. He doesn't; he has not yet been provided, in his mind, a person who has adequate, direct, first-hand, provable knowledge about the possession of uh, extraterrestrial spacecraft. That, that uh, his position is that none of the 40 witnesses that are prepared and have already testified uh, under oath secretly uh, in sworn depositions, that none of them, to the satisfaction of Warner, have yet provided him with in, uh, indisputable proof and the firsthand uh, nature uh, that is slam dunk, incontestable proof uh, that, they're, that we are in possession of such a craft. Uh, and, and so that's a challenge right now. And those are the kind of people that are buried more deeply into the legacy group. Uh, and the legacy group people don't want to come forward right now because two reasons. Number one, they don't want to come forward <laughs> because they're part of the program that's still going on. And they have been involved uh, for a long time in suppressing this information. And they have not changed their mind. They don't want to reveal this. But secondly, they don't believe that the whistleblower protection legislation that's presently in place would adequately protect them. And, and so that that's the reason that we, the New Paradigm Institute, has put in this other additional piece of legislation over on the House side to try to provide that kind of additional protection to them. Uh, the most important aspect of which is to give them a legal cause of action against uh, anyone who actually uh, tries to intimidate them. Uh, or deprive them of any promotion, or try to challenge their security clearance. You know, we've listed a whole bunch of things in there. Now, that there is, as I said, and it's a little complicated, it is true that Senator Blumenthal has proposed on the Senate side a general whistleblower protection uh, increase, an enhanced whistleblower protection uh, statute, generally for everybody throughout the entire federal government. Uh, but it doesn't provide special, the kind of special extra protection that the UFO people will need to have uh, in their judgment, you know. Uh, and so that that's the, that's the state of things right now. I'm not naive enough to ask you to speak on individuals who may or may not be talking to you. You're legally representing them potentially. You're not going to be able to answer or nor would you want to answer that. But speaking more broadly, if I am someone on one of these crash retrieval programs, I imagine in my head, I think, Danny, like the fire service where you're sitting about in an office and now and again, the bell goes and you go to a fire. You don't drive about looking for fires. How active are these people? And I suppose what I'd like to know is, are you aware of recent crash retrievals happening or are these very few and far between? Well, no, the, but I, I do know this. I do know that the Central Intelligence Agency itself has a center that nobody knew about uh, and, and actually most other people don't know about now uh, that that was that was able to detect UFOs flying around even when they're fully uh, masked you know even when they're not visible at all and when they don't show up on any radar that there is a, a technology that the has been developed uh, that they, the, the, the code name for it is called Golden Domes. Uh, and they're able to detect the UFOs of where they're going and coming. Uh, so that, and, and what I'm concerned about is that that may be part of the quote kinetic program, you know, to find out where they are. Because if you can find out where mm -hmm. they are, 
then you might be able to engage them in some way to try to bring them down. Uh, and now all of that, uh, all of this kind of deep into the weeds kind of information about how the legislation is going and how we're doing, you know, is separate from the question of whether or not our national security state people uh, are engaged in hostile acts toward them, such as that, or whether they actually have some sort of line of communication going to them, or at least one or more of the species, you know, that has some sort of diplomatic relations with them, that has some sort of an understanding with them. Uh, such that they might have been conceivably allowed to have access to one of the craft or one or more that are not crashed that are uh, and, and they have that they've got at least a couple fully intact you know operational uh, extraterrestrial non-human spacecraft so they've got them uh, in that they're now that, that that makes them probably easier to try to figure out how they run. <laughs> Uh, uh, and then there's an, uh, a third question that is extraordinarily important. You know, has there been a set of communications going on with one or more of the species of the probably five least different species that are commonly understood to be coming and going from here? Is there been any communication with them pursuant to which any of them are cooperating with our national security agencies to help show them how to fly these things? <laughs> because because one of the one of the challenges is is that there appears to be pretty solidly established now uh, um, the method by means of which these craft are are navigated are are operated is telepathically that the that the the pilots of these craft telepathically communicate with the craft and the craft are some kind of extraordinarily uh, highly developed uh, AI that has got like it's all, almost its own consciousness uh, and that they they telepathically communicate with the craft uh, and it's that way that they they navigate and, and it's uh, apparently a, a major challenge to the <laughs> to the people in the united states military whose consciousnesses aren't high enough <laughs> to actually operate the craft you know <laughs> so so that there there's a, there's some challenges like that that apparently they've been confronted by uh, so that that uh, so there are there are the technical in the weeds uh, legislative questions about where we are with the Schumer bill and what amendments are being proposed in it and how, how what's the relationship between the Senate and the House the Senate under the control of the Democratic Party the House under the control of the Republican Party there's a lot of in the weeds kind of questions like that but there are these other more kind of transcendental questions you know about what our relationship is with these these beings do they have any kind of uh, a juridical relationship with each other, these five or so different species, is there some sort of alliance that they have uh, pursuant to which they're governed by some protocols uh, with regard to whether they can communicate with uh, one or more of our country, our nation states? Uh, do they have to agree to only communicate with all of them together? You know, and these are all things that the, the problem is that we haven't been able to get the Congress uh, to pay attention yet to those kind of things because they're still way in the mode of trying to find out for sure whether it's true, <laughs> you know, that they're even here, you know? So, and they're trying, they're trying to get, and the challenge of it is they're trying to get the, the uh, legacy group to come and tell them, you know? And so they're still allowing themselves to be in a position of, of allowing the legacy group to be the ones that are really going to decide whether they're going to reveal the information or not. And the House of Representatives has specifically refused to allow the, the, the panel to be put together to establish this independent board that has subpoena power uh, and that can issue subpoenas to mandate that the information be provided, you know, and to take depositions if it's withheld, to find out who's got the information and where it is and what the nature of it is, et cetera. So the, the House of Representatives has still allowed the heads of the different defense department agencies and intelligence agencies to make the decision as to whether or not they're even going to admit they've got it. You know, and so what it's really like to, to make a, an unfortunate analogy is just like the Democratic Party right now is in a position saying they have to wait for, for Biden to decide whether or not he's going to withdraw. 
You know, like they aren't taking it into their hands to say, look, at we're, we're, the Democratic Party is faced with this disaster here, you know, that all of the polls are showing that if Biden remains the candidate for the Democratic Party, they're going to lose in kind of a, a you know, a sweep, you know, uh, against uh, against Trump. Now, especially now that he has such sympathy uh, of having survived this assassination attempt. And so the, 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 the whole Congress is in the same kind of uh, technical position. They're waiting for the very people who are refusing to cooperate <laughs> to make the decision as to whether they're going to cooperate. And, and we know that they're not because they've refused to cooperate for 80 years. So there's a lot to unpack there, OK? And I have to obviously be careful for time what I talk about because there's so much to get through, Danny. I appreciate some of the stuff you've said. The... Let's call it the boring stuff, okay, for a layman like me, the legislative stuff, that I'm, I'm sure you find much more interesting, but most folks are going to see process, legislation, language, legalese as, as boring, but it seems to be to get this kind of conversation in front of Congress, you have to, you have to plate it up that way. However, right. the stuff that would be really interesting, I think, to 99.9% .9 of the entire public is that other stuff you were talking about. But there's this, there's this invisible force in the middle that keeps the two of them apart. Like, you know, magnets, the opposite side of magnets pushing against each other where something just stops them meeting and combining. And you think it's those legacy folks coming forward, but they need the protection, the whistleblower protection to right. unlock that and go, look, let's start having those conversations and seeing that mixed together. Is that about right? Yeah. That is absolutely correct. Man. Okay. Um, I'd love to ask though. You mentioned uh, was it Golden Dome was the name of the yes. project. Yes. Like, what? How successful is that sort of project? And I ask, uh, what sort of success rate have they had that you know? Because surely that's something pretty tangible that a congressman or woman senator would love to know. We have this piece of technology which is tracking this other exotic technology, and this is what we've got from it. Surely that sort of thing is is, is something you can get your teeth into. No, we no, we don't. We don't know that that Golden Domes technology has been uh, developed based on any captured UFOs. I mean, that that may well have been a technology that's been developed uh, on our own. Uh, sure. But they've got it, uh, and they've they've figured that out. Now, I wouldn't deign to talk about it if I didn't realize that the UFO people know they've got it. <laughs> no, <laughs> so it's it's not a secret from them uh, that they're being tracked. Uh, uh, and, and so that, that, and so that they, even though they have a signal, uh, neutralization capacity, you know, they, they can hide themselves from radar, uh, and they can cloak, uh, et cetera, you know, uh, but they, they obviously know that that cloaking has been penetrated now by us. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, so, so we do know where they are. And, and so that the, the reality is, is that they're, they're almost has to be some much higher level of communication going on between the deepest elements inside the legacy group and at least one or more of these extraterrestrial, uh, almost certainly extraterrestrial uh, uh, beings that are coming and going here. Uh, because, you know, otherwise there would be a lot more confrontations that would be taking place between them. And it's not. There's some kind of cooperation going on here, some sort of a coordinated program uh, that's, that's going on. And you can't get Congress to start paying attention to that until they have been indisputably, uh, irrevocably convinced <laughs> that the whole pr thing's happening, you know, uh, because they're, they're afraid. They're still afraid because of the 80 year program that the covert operations uh, divisions of the CIA. Uh, in the, mil the military, the Pentagon, have been intimidating everybody to be ruin their career if they try to come forward and admit that this is true, you know, uh, or conduct themselves as though they think it's true, because they will be attacked by some of their constituents for being crazy, right? So that so yeah. that they're they're fearful. I mean, the the, the kind of people that are in Congress, uh, uh, both in the House and Senate, uh, are afraid of their constituents. <laughs> You know, yeah, because because they they've gotten they've gotten inside the beltway uh, and they're participating as part of this club that exists inside the beltway that makes decisions 
that are more or less independent from the interests and desires of the people <laughs> because they're, 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 not, they're not in direct, immediate democratic contact with their people in the way they should be. Uh, and so they're afraid of the people because they think the people have very primitive ideas or they're very simple minded uh, and they're not very sophisticated. And so that they're, they're afraid of them. Uh, and so that the, I think most of the people in the, in the Senate now are the house side are taking the position that look until they're in a position where they can present indis indisputable evidence to their constituents that this is true they're afraid to start conducting themselves predicated on the knowledge that it's true and so they're not asking the other questions they're not preparing our whole people for the revelation of this information they're not asking what the repercussions are going to be on our geopolitical structures with other nation states. They're not asking what the impact is going to be on our economy. Uh, they're not trying to, they're, they're not, all they're trying to do is figure out how to back engineer the technology so they can make weapons out of it. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, that's the, the government activity that's going on right now. Uh, and that's, uh, that's unfortunate, you know, uh, tragic, actually. You know, so the, the New Paradigm Institute, we're trying to get past that. We're trying to deal with the congressmen and senators and, and facilitate getting them the kind of information they believe they need uh, in order to move to that next level of really trying to find out the answer to these substantive questions uh, that are so important, you know, and, uh, and really represent the real transition that's going to take place, that's going to move our entire human family into an entire other epic. Uh, of our of our history, you know that all 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 time may be measured, Andy, from the point of actual uh, disclosure of what it is that's going on right now. All time may be measured before this and after this, you know, uh, just like uh, A.D. and B.C. <laughs> you know, right, right now, uh, the, that that uh, and so that's that's the scale of what it is that we're looking at, uh, and and yet. You know, our, our people are all functioning now in kind of chaos with, you know, with Israel bombing, you know, and killing tens of thousands of non-combatant people in the Gaza. And the people over with the, with the Gaza, Palestinian people coming over and killing, you know, Israeli people and, you know, the, Russia invading Ukraine and Ukraine, you know, bombing Russia now. You know, I mean, these are all we're, we're functioning at such a low level of consciousness. Uh, in the context of this larger cosmic uh, context that we really are in. Uh, we, we are like uh, tribes on a little Pacific island back in the 1950s that didn't know there was an outside world. And our whole yeah. consciousness is taken up about, you know, fighting between two of the groups in the tribes. <laughs> you know, uh, that's, that's the kind of situation that we find ourselves in. I think arguably one of those who moved the needle the most would be David Grush in the last 12 months because yeah. he got the attention of the subject on an international stage. And I've said ad nauseum that it hit the shores and the mainstream media in the UK. That's, that's a big deal. And that, I think, could be a really good measurement for anyone even in the United States who looks at this subject in the microcosm of the States. Does the story hit the UK? Because if it does, then it means something in terms of UFOs because it's, it's hard to get it to penetrate our, our news cycle. Um, what's the status, as far as you know, of David Grush? And do you know anything at all about this fabled op-ed that people seem to be <laughs> expecting to drop any day for the last 18 years? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm not at liberty to discuss any of the conversations that I have with David or else I won't have any more conversations with David. Uh, you know, David is in charge of deciding what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, uh, and what he wants to say uh, in this. So the same thing is true with Lou. Lou's got his book coming out in the middle of August, you know, uh, and, uh, and he is, uh, and, and it's extraordinarily important to remember, Andy, and this is really, really important, that both David Grush and Lou Elizondo, the only things that they have said publicly have all been authorized by the United States Defense Department. That they have everything they have said has been cleared by the United States Defense Department Office of Pre-Publication Review and Security. They have authorized those statements, uh, and so the, the question really is: is you know what does that mean? You know who who is it that's giving them the instructions 
that are authorizing them to say these things? And how much are they being authorized to say? And who's in charge of making those decisions right now? So there's there's a shadow game going on behind the scenes here at a higher level uh, that we that we have to kind of monitor. The skeptics would argue, and bear in mind what I do, and you know me well enough, I think at this point, Danny, I'm not a skeptic per se. I can be skeptical um, <laughs> that Dopser will only potentially refute information that would harm national security potentially. So I think some of the arguments folks have had in the past with, for example, the the George Knapp books uh, with James Lukatsky and, and co, where that yes. you could put a load of lies in there and just because dops are clear it, and again, folks, I'm not saying those books are lies. That's not my point. But you could put a lot of lies in there. And just because it's stops are reviewed doesn't mean it's all truth. So how do you frame that to people that the David Grush op-ed, which would, I'm presuming, be DOPS or reviewed, if it indeed comes out, or a Luis Elizondo book, Eminent, which is due out, like you say, next month. What should people really be looking at these for, and why are they so important? Well, I would. I think that uh, that I, I don't think that either uh, either David Grush or Lou are saying anything that are lies. You know, so that the the DOPS group. You know, that they would assume, I would assume, that, you know, any kind of conscious lie being told by either David Grush or Lou Elizondo about this subject would, in fact, from their perspective, be damaging to the national security if they're lying, unless they're being coached to lie. Uh, and Dobster has been clued in on that, uh, in that they're part of some sort of a deception program. And, you know, I mean, that's that's the position that Stephen Greer takes, you know, is that this is some sort of a deception program that is going on. Yeah. And they're all part of it. You know, I don't agree with that. You know, that's why Stephen and I have had some disagreements about that. Uh, but the the but we what we're trying to figure out at the New Paradigm Institute is, you know, to what degree uh, it, are there decisions being made at a level above both Lou uh, and David? Uh, and Dobser, you know, uh, what what types of decisions are being made above them as to what kind of information is going to be revealed here? You know, and how soon is it going to be revealed? Uh, and what is a, a controlled disclosure? The, the, the thing that we're still operating with here, Andy, is this is so important, is that the United States Senate has taken into all consideration all these factors that are going on have come forward with a Schumer rounds bill, which they're in fact doubling down on saying, this is the decision that's been made, you know, to have a controlled disclosure and that we're going to have this panel that's going to be appointed by the president that is going to develop an entire UFO controlled disclosure campaign. You know, that's been decided and that's uh, trans historical uh, that, that, that that has occurred. You know, in uh, the fact that there's this weird thing happening over on the House side, <laughs> that these couple of guys who are on the payroll, basically, of the private aerospace corporations that want to get private patents on things, you know, and keep it secret, you know, are messing up the plan. You know, there, there's a plan afoot. Uh, there's a decision that's been made at very high levels uh, that is in favor of the Schumer rounds bill. In that whole process, and that is a seven-year controlled disclosure process that's going to roll this out over a seven-year period, and all of the information that is 25 years old or more, which we all understand is extraordinarily important <laughs> because it covers Roswell, it, it covers you know Betty and Barney Hill, it covers the Aztec crash, it co covers everything that was done basically before the year 2000. You know, and the present resolution of that uh, on the Senate side is to reveal all of that information. You know, and so the, the, one of the reasons our new Paradigm Institute is in place in Washington is to figure out how to absorb all that information and divide it up into pieces that can be understood by people and, and get it put out uh, in a popular, understandable format. Also accompanied by, therefore, what are the implications of this? 
you know, and what are the steps that we need to take uh, our different institutions, our economic institutions, our religious institutions, you know, our uh, university institutions. What, what do we have to do in light of this information? You know, that's what the people want to know. Uh, and, and we're still being held up because the, the Congress had not yet been shown the definitive information that's going to transform them into telling their constituents that this is true. Right. They haven't quite gotten there yet because they're still relying upon, in a sense, the voluntary cooperation of people inside the the uh, legacy group. So they're still leaving the power in the hands of the legacy group to control the rate at which this information is be, going to be released. And the challenge, the problem is, uh, if you had to get down to the root problem of this, is that the relationship between the people in the deepest elements of the legacy group, their relationship with the private aerospace corporations is so intimate that they're being controlled by the aerospace corporations uh, and saying, we don't want this made public because we want to profit from this and we want to have patents on this. We want the United States government to be put in the whole world to be put in the position of having to license Every single use of this technology that they ever want to use, they have to pay license fees to us. I mean, you know, for the technology that was put into their hands by the government, you know, and, and it's kind of a preposterous situation, but it's a it's a it's a profoundly corrupt aspect of the economic system that we have, which is a capitalist profit motivated uh, economic system. And it's. It's, it's the flaw of that system is now manifesting itself uh, with the most cosmic implications right now. And just for the record, folks, I'm very much looking forward to Lou Elizondo's book coming out um, and David Grush's op-ed, if indeed that comes out. At this point, I don't see why David Grush wouldn't have also been offered a book deal because what he said in a short frame of time, I'm sure could fill several books over given what he done as well so maybe that's something that, as to why it's been held up but that's pure speculation um on that danny i want to ask is there a point let's talk worst case scenario we can't keep coming back to this same interview each year where i ask you about the uap disclosure act 3.0 4.0 5.0 is yep. there a time and place where frontline folks like yourself former ic officials journalists documentary makers people who are in the know hit a big red button and sources, methods, all those protections go out the window and the floodgates are opened to whatever end. How, how does this stop and progress if the floodgates keep going up? Well, this is, I, I, I guess this is uh, a complex way of putting the catastrophic disclosure question. <laughs> you know, this is, is that, you know, what, what uh, the, the uh, people in the legacy group keep characterizing as catastrophic disclosure. You know, it's just sort of the floodgates open. Uh, yeah. That what uh, the and so the, the the question really is is what is the capacity of the new paradigm institute, which is the, the citizen group that has actually been designated in Schumer rounds, you know, to participate in nominating people to this nine person panel, you know that you know what what is what is our capacity to actually generate disclosure. Uh, if, in fact, the legacy group people don't cooperate uh, and the Congress doesn't give them the adequate protections that they believe they need and the amnesty that they're requesting uh, and they don't cooperate, you know, what is our capacity to bring about disclosure? Uh, I think the thing that uniquely qualifies the New Paradigm Institute is that we're trusted as part of the, the UFO community uh, along with 47 years you know, of 20 years of being the legal counsel for the Disclosure Project with Stephen Greer, being Lou Elizondo's lawyer, being John Mack's lawyer, you know, uh, uh, you know, being the people in the Carter administration that were helping to get uh, information to President Carter all the way back in 1977, that we have to earn the trust of all of these different parties uh, to exercise responsibility uh, in the way that we would bring about disclosure. You know, if, if we were to get all of the information tomorrow afternoon, we have to make a decision, you know, as to how quickly all of this stuff has to come out, how you package it, 
how you communicate it to people, how you reach out and try to get the different institutions prepared to absorb this. You know, there, there's a, a, a responsibility for, for governing here uh, that the, the New Paradigm Institute has to uh, consider. And, and we're in the process of doing that right now. Uh, and, uh, but we still refuse to accept security clearances <laughs> because we know perfectly well if we accept the security clearance, they're going to, the other side is going to assert everything that we know we only got because we had the security clearance. Uh, mm-hmm. And they're going to threaten to put us in prison if we tell the people about it, you know, because I mean, that's the, the hammer that they use to try to keep the secret. So we've refused to take uh, security clearances uh, and that we're exercising responsible uh, decision making authority you know, over how the information is to be revealed. And it manifests in the form of our recommendations as to who we believe ought to be on the nine person panel. <laughs> uh, and they're different than the legacy group people are proposing. The legacy group people are proposing people that are basically themselves. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You know, that, to, to be on the panel and, and therefore they just keep the lid on 99 percent of it. Uh, and uh, we're we're recommending people who are much more disposed toward making this available to the public, but doing so in a genuinely responsible manner. You know, so this choreographed in a way that is commensurate with preparing our institutions and our people to be able to absorb this without being unduly traumatized. Right. Uh and so that this is a, an extraordinarily sophisticated process that's going on right now beneath all of this chaos that's going on on the surface of, you know, not knowing who the president's going to be and what's the difference going to be. You know, is is Donald Trump, is he chastened? Is he really a different person now that he has faced death squarely in the face? And is he humbled? You know, so we'll know more by tonight. You know, he's going to be doing his major speech. Uh, at the National Republican Convention, uh, which I would recommend everybody tune into to see, are we dealing with a chastened, different Donald Trump now here? You know, uh, has he has he looked his own mortality in the face uh, and been humbled? And and are, are the Democrats going to continue to be, you know, just shifting from one foot to another here and not knowing what to do like deer in the headlights here? You know, are, are, are they going to stick with Biden? When you know, 82 percent of the people in the country now don't believe that he's capable of really performing a, a second term. You know, everybody loves him. Most everybody loves him, except for the Trump 18 percent of the people in the country that are super Trumpy people who love him the way he used to be. <laughs> right. So so the, these these all these all this turmoil is going on sort of on the surface. But there's this important process going on deep in the background now of October 20th coming rolling up here. Uh, and the question is, you know, what, if anything, is going to be turned over to the National Archives and to the intelligence committees, you know, pertaining to this extraordinary, you know, history altering uh, set of information. Let's get to some listener questions, Danny, to finish off. I think you've covered a lot there, and I, I really appreciate that. Uh, some really good answers, uh, really full answers too, so thank you. Um, loads to get through. A lot of the questions people asked, we've covered in okay. some of the stuff we've said. Um, picking a few of the main ones before we finish up, uh, from Mira in Vienna, Austria. Uh, she says, why is everyone waiting for the government and not trying instead to win over, for example, 60 Minutes, you know, mainstream media, and send some of the best whistleblowers to them. Now, I appreciate there's a protection issue there, but what sort of impact would that have for you? Well, I mean, if if uh, if one of the people from the legacy group were to show up on 60 Minutes uh, and testify in detail about what he or she knew about the crash retrieval program uh, and or the, the back engineering program, or even more importantly, some of these other more cosmic questions that we're asking here tonight, uh, you know, that they would be prosecuted immediately. You know, I mean, they, they would probably, not only that, but the, the national security state people would know. They'd find out right away uh, that 60 Minutes was planning to do this. They wouldn't be able to get away with doing it in secret and preparing this, this, uh, this announcement, you know, and the, they would contact the people at CBS, you know, and make sure that CBS didn't do it. Uh, and if CBS, for any reason, conceivably, decided they were going to push forward and do it anyhow, 
they would go and arrest this person. The, the national security state would find out who the person is and they would go and arrest them. You know, I mean, that's the, that's the threat that these people are under right now. Uh, and that's what they keep saying to us over and over again is, you know, they know that the, the, that the national security state has been authorized to deploy lethal force to keep this secret. Now, they know that. Uh, and they know that, you know, the un, unlike most of the citizens, they know what this looks like, that, that there's a wet operation capacity that the operations director to the Central Intelligence, he has, Central Intelligence Agency has, uh, and they're willing to deploy that stateside. You know, they don't just confine themselves to doing that stuff uh, outside of the country. They will deploy that operation stateside. And the people deep into the national security state know that. And so they're saying, you know, well, I'm not kind of, I'm not a fool here. You know, I'm not going to go on 60 minutes, you know, and, and, and talk to them uh, and, and not realize that I'm going to get arrested and disappeared. You know, so that, well, I mean, that's the answer to the question. No, no, that's very fair. Um, and you touched on just before a few minutes ago, catastrophic disclosure. Um, but looking for maybe a more direct answer to this from Nicholas, he asks, will catastrophic disclosure significantly increase in likelihood if this bill is not passed or if it's just watered down to get through? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah. Because the, the only option that the National Security State people are leaving us if they won't cooperate with a controlled disclosure program, the only option they're leaving uh, is potential catastrophic disclosure uh, from their perspective anyway. Uh, and so the, 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 the onus falls upon us at the New Paradigm Institute as the citizen group that's being invited in to participate and try to craft this controlled disclosure, you know, that we have to try to determine you know, whether we're going to be participating in what might be legitimately perceived as catastrophic disclosure, or are we going to be participating more in what would be a responsible controlled disclosure, you know, whether the government's involved in it or not, uh, you know, and, uh, and we're, we're, of course, able to be in communication with people that are, are these potential witnesses, because they're the ones looking for legal protection. <laughs> You know, and we're offering in the bill that we presented to Tim Burchette over on the House side, we're offering a forms of amnesty. To some, and we understand the scope of the amnesty that needs to really be provided to them. I mean, these people are going to have to be put in the witness protection program. You know, I mean, we know that, you know, that they're, they're, they're not, their life is, is going to be over uh, as they know it, you know, if they, if they break the rules here. Uh, and, and so that, that's, uh, we know that. So that that's uh, that's the so we don't we we don't want catastrophic disclosure, uh, any kind of real catastrophic disclosure. But you need to understand that how the some of the people in the legacy group perceive catastrophic disclosure. For example, they are insisting, and we know this because we've been involved in the potential nomination of these people to the board. That the, the people in the legacy group do view catastrophic disclosure as anything that threatens the existent present elements of power. They don't want the economic system changed. They don't want the, any of the institutions changed. Uh, they don't want any of that stuff to change, you know, and it's absolutely inevitable that there have to be changes, right? And, and they don't want them to be made. Uh, and so they're viewing that as catastrophic disclosure. We at the New Paradigm Institute as the citizens group don't view that as catastrophic. You know, the, the, and so, but, but we need to figure out, is, is there anything that would be catastrophic? For example, if we were to learn that the uh, elements inside our national security state have established some treaty with one or more of the extraterrestrial civilizations that are authorizing them to be kidnapping our people in, you know, in, in, in engaging in hybrid, you know, <laughs> pregnancies with our, our people, you know, uh, that could undermine in some catastrophic way the confidence of the of people in the entire government. You know, and the, now the question is, is that good or bad? You know, I happen to think that's not a good idea. <laughs> I, think, I think that, you know, we ought to be able to maintain a, a, a deserved, you know, level of confidence in the governing uh, people. 
you know, and if, if we're going to replace them, we'd have to go through some sort of more extensive process of, of uh, removing them from government and putting in more responsible people. But you wouldn't want to just collapse the entire system. You don't want to do that. I, I'm not sure there is any such information. You know, my experience, as I've mentioned before, with the, in the Pentagon Papers case, you know, the whole Nixon administration and Justice Department and, you know, national security state people were jumping up and down, you know, turning blue, you know, saying, that, oh, if you reveal these 47 volumes, it's going to be catastrophic. You know, it's going to be irrevocable damage to the national security of the United States. And I kept saying over and over again, like what? Like, what are we talking about here? And then they kept saying, well, we can't tell you because you don't have adequate security clearances, <laughs> you know, so, so that, you know, they can't, they can't get away with that. They can't continue to get away with that. So that what we have to do is have, make our own decisions as citizens as to what we view to be catastrophic, what we view to be necessary changes that are probably going to have to be developed, uh, and that we need to have more information, you know, as a people. And that's the New Paradigm Institute exists to try to get that information to our people so that we can have the information we need to make intelligent decisions like this collectively. I wanted to ask you when we spoke about whistleblowers that's just came back to me. Uh, what's the New Paradigm Institute's uh, stance or opinion on the UAP disclosure fund that's been set up by Lou Elizondo, Gary Nolan and, and that group? Well, the, the, we, the, we've uh, the the it wasn't set up by that group actually <laughs> it was it was set up by just one of the people in that group uh and they're, they they're obviously heavily them, involved yeah they, they asked them to help be advisors and stuff and all of a sudden they ended up becoming designated as a board you know we're we're in co complete cooperation with them yuan uh and all the guys that are over there you know that that the, but you know the the new paradigm institute you know uh has has a staff of you know 25 people you know, we have a you know massive you know uh, outreach to people, hundreds of thousands of people. We got 40 years of experience uh, in doing things like this. We're crafting legislation that's going on. That there's a different capacity here that we have, uh, but we're in totally positive relationships with the uh, the uh, UAP Disclosure Fund. We're in positive relations with Saul. You know that uh, that you know we're we're in positive relations with people. Some of them inside the Legacy Group. Uh, in, and with both the Republicans and Democrats, you know, we're, we're trying, one of the major objectives that we have is to try to keep everybody together cooperating uh, in a positive way, which includes trying to get some degree of cooperation from the people in the legacy group, you know, uh, but the people that are, that are on the board of advisors of the, uh, the uh, UAP disclosure group, you know, the, the fellows that you, you mentioned, you know, are, are the people who are attempting to establish a controlled disclosure. You know, we're the, and so we're all cooperating on that. Uh, and that there's no, uh, as far as I know, uh, the, one of the outliers right now, at least in the mind of those, those people, you know, is Stephen Greer, uh, who they think is favoring what they refer to as catastrophic disclosure. Uh, and, uh, and uh, I, don't, uh, I don't think that's true. I think that Stephen Stephen has been involved in this for 40 years. You know, he's been meeting with people, you know, uh, all across the spectrum for dozens of years. And and I think that the the people need to be more cooperative with each other, less hostile, not think that they're being competitive in any way, <clears throat> you know, uh, in in tone down tone down uh, the kind of potential uh, com competitiveness and and, and animosity, you know, you know, it mo most paradigmatically, it comes up over and over again between Lou and Stephen Greer, <laughs> you know, of uh, kind of excoriating each other uh, that, you know, that, uh, and I know Lou gets upset if I say anything publicly uh, about trying to get everybody to cooperate a little bit more. Uh, and Stephen Greer gets all upset if I think that he ought to be more cooperative with people. Uh, and so that we have to, we have to, you know, experience that, you know, and, and try to be peacemakers here uh, and keep everybody going forward so that the the, the UAP Disclosure Fund, uh, you know, has one one staff person, <laughs> you know, uh, and no experience at all, you know, in this. 
And so we're trying to cooperate with them and say, okay, what, how, how is it that you are uniquely going to be uh, contributing to this, this whole process? You know, uh, in that and it is true. It is true that, uh, that some of the people I think that are on their, their board realize that the new paradigm Institute isn't that controllable. Yeah, that, that we have a genuine commitment to the public interest uh, uh, that we view to be different than uh, people who are all inside the military uh, and inside the intelligence community. We believe that that, that, that lens that they look at things through uh, is more conservative uh, than the, the public interest really requires. Uh, but, they, but they know that. Uh, and but but everybody's in totally positive relations with each other uh, as of right now, and I hope it's going to remain that way. That Elizondo versus Greer conversation is a whole other path to go down, and we can have that another time, I think. Uh, but and but everyone's got their opinion on it as well. So listen, Danny, I think you were saved by the bell there. You've been very generous with your time. A whole lot of questions I can't get to. I'm going to keep them and ask if you can come back on as soon as possible sure. again when you do have a spare hour and we'll get through loads of those questions. And hopefully there'll be some updates by that point as well. Absolutely. Terrific, Andy. I'm delighted to do it. It's a privilege to get yeah. to talk to you. And one more question. I would never want to put you on the spot, Danny, but if you had sure. to pick uh, Stephen Greer or Lou Elizondo, who would you side with? I'm joking. I wouldn't ask you to answer that, Danny. I would never ask you, unless you <laughs> unless you wanted to. But I'm sure you were getting a lot of trouble off someone. Well, I've been I've been uh, the lawyer for both, you know, and uh, and that I am I am from my perspective much more convinced I think than either one of them that there is a lot more area for them to agree upon uh, than either one of them might think. Uh, yeah. You know, and both of them are unhappy that I would even say that. <laughs> Which I I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out how to get them uh, to cooperate with everybody uh, and you know and uh, both of them have very strong personalities both of them have uh, have devoted an extraordinary amount of time and sacrifice to to getting disclosure done uh, and so I'm hoping that as as time evolves here that uh, people are going to come to see that we have to try to all get cooperative. Uh, and and make this thing make this thing happen sooner than too late. Spoken like a true lawyer, Danny. I'll, we'll leave it there. But thank you very much. I always appreciate your time. And folks, oh, go well, check then. out the new Paradigm Institute website. I'll put the link in the description, and we'll get Danny yeah. back on very soon. Yeah, and, and, and I think we should point out because all my staff keeps telling me that the people need to understand that if you go to newparadigm.org on our brand new website, we've got this big $60,000 website that we've just come out with on Monday, you know, you can sign up to be volunteers to participate in this. You can be much more participatory in this process. Uh, and, you know, in order to build out the staff that we need to, to have, like, we've got 550 volunteers. So we need to have, like, a volunteer coordinator that can help divide them all up into their areas of specialization and what they can do. And so that people realize that it's a tax deductible contribution. Uh, and if I don't tell people that when I when I talk with them over the, the programs like this, my whole staff jumps up and down on me for my, that's probably them calling <laughs> saying you haven't said anything about people making donations. But so I, I'm just suggesting that, that, that people consider doing that, you know, you know, ten dollars, twenty dollars a month, you know, uh, is all tax deductible. Uh, and it'll help us build out the staff to be able to help build the kind of cooperative base for our citizens that we need. Danny, awesome. Thank you so much. And I'll put all those links in the description for folks as well to make it easy. Terrific. I appreciate that, Andy. Thank you. That is all for this episode. Thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. Apple and Spotify do make a huge difference to the algorithm. If you're checking the show out on YouTube, please don't forget to like and leave a comment on here as well. Any sharing you do is very much appreciated on any social media platform. And finally, you can listen to shows ad-free and sponsor-free in their glorious full versions by subscribing for less than the price of a coffee on Apple, Spotify, just search That UFO Podcast Premium. YouTube, you can sign up and be a member or you can do that through patreon.com. Thank you very much for listening, folks. 
wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shut out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and 